Hello and welcome to this edition of Tech 24. This week, we speak to Guillaume Rosier at just 24 years old, and from his bedroom, he came up with an innovative data visualization concept that is now helping decision makers and health workers mitigate the outbreak. His tool could also be even more useful in the months to come to track the emergence of new strains of the virus. And in Test24, we tried the ZenBook Duo 14. It's no regular 14-inch laptop. Its main selling point is the fact that it comes with two screens that fold neatly together. But first, the grand prize of this year's France 24 RFI Africa App Challenge has been awarded to Amara Diawara from Guinea. He has developed a telemedicine app for professionals that facilitates online medical consultations and also gives access to health records and vaccination certificates. Our reporters in Conakry, Sarasako and Malik Diakite met with this insightful businessman. Every morning, Amara Diawara does his rounds in Conakry, Guinea's capital city. The doctor lives in Paris but spends his free time in his country of origin where he's developing a startup called AfriCare. He first had the idea after falling ill while studying in France. I was told I had a tumor in my right lung, so I followed treatment for two years in Paris hospitals. And it was during this follow-up that I realized the usefulness of digital tools to follow up and in setting up appointments. Launched a year ago, AfriCare enables patients to make appointments online and gives doctors one-click access to all patient information. A valuable tool for health professionals like Dr Diallo, one of Amara Diawara's first clients. It's a platform that's accessible, easy to use and that allows us to manage our patients very easily. We can register them and have access to all their information. They don't waste their time because the appointments are scheduled in advance. For now, access to the platform is entirely free of charge. Eventually, the subscription for doctors will be 200,000 Guinean francs per month, less than 20 euros. As a doctor, I know that health professionals in most countries in Africa, whether in Guinea or Mali, don't have these kinds of tools. They don't have the means to have tools in their health centers, in their clinics, to try to interact with their patients at a distance. To get his startup off the ground, he's launched a fundraising campaign and the launch of AfriCare 2.0. Adama Jawara hopes to become the leader in online healthcare in Africa by 2025. And let's now turn to our tech editor, Peter O'Brien, who's going to take us on a world tour of other such solutions. Hello and welcome, Peter. Hi, Julia. So sometimes the solution can actually be inside our phones, especially if it's a phone from uh, the manufacturer Umidigi. Umidigi, yes. Yeah. So they're based in Shenzhen and they partnered with Red Green in Bangladesh. So they ship their entry-level phones worldwide. And a number of their models now come with infrared thermometers. They're accurate to within 0.2 two degrees Celsius and you just point it at someone's face as if you're taking a picture and it will read their temperature which is very useful for detecting things like COVID or other illnesses as well. Now there's a, another solution that can pick up weak signals even if you don't have symptoms and it's coming from New Zealand. Yeah so the New Zealand company Datamine have uh, created an app called Elam and the idea is to let you know you're ill before you even feel ill. So it picks up from your wearable so be it a Fitbit or an Apple Watch something like that, it will compare the data provided by this device to your baseline metrics, so things like um, your skin temperature, things like your heart rate, and it will detect early fluctuations and signs of disease up to three days in advance of symptoms emerging. Now, the need to limit, of course, the number of people in certain spaces has sped up uh, the development of people counting technologies. Mm. That's why sometimes you have huge queues in front of stores. And that's yeah. perhaps what they've been using at the France 24 canteen, because there are indeed huge queues as well. Yeah, I'm always getting hungry outside while I wait to go in. And it's because they cap the number of people. Now, there are a number of technologies you can do to, to achieve this. And one is video uh, counting tech. So that uh, feeds in footage of inside um, a public space and puts it through an algorithm, estimates how many people are inside. Other things you can, to, can use are infrared beams in the doorway um, or what we see here, which is a kind of floor mat developed by the Swiss company Technis, which is an array of pressure sensors which detect footfall with up to 98% accuracy. 
Well, thank you very much, Peter, for that. Now he's considered an IT genius at only 24 years old. Guillaume Grazier has his head up high in clouds of data. Since last spring, he's been developing a platform called COVID Tracker. And as the name suggests, it helps track the evolution of the global pandemic. Well, for more on this project, let's turn to Guillaume Rosier himself. Hello, Guillaume. Hello, thank you for having me. So COVID Tracker and Vaccine Tracker have become a useful tools for health workers, decision makers and journalists alike. So how did you come up with the idea and how are you aggregating data? Yes, um, it's quite a funny story because um, I never decided to, to build COVID Tracker. Uh, it was not anticipated. I just started to, to make a first chart uh, really early in March 2020. Uh, it was, you know, uh, 10 days before lockdown in France, uh, and we did not imagine that one day a European country would be confined. Uh, so I just compared the confirmed cases in France and uh, in Italy, and I was really surprised because the, we had the same exponential growth uh, in France than Italy. So I shared this chart with my friends and family and on Twitter, and people became addicted to the chart. They wanted an update every day. Uh, so I decided to, to build a blank web page uh, with uh, only the chart on it. Um, uh, so then I, I was able to share the link with uh, all of them, and they, they can view the, the chart. Uh, and month after month, day after day, uh, it became bigger and bigger, and it became a COVID tracker. Uh, COVID tracker only use uh, data from uh, public authorities and services. So you found some inspiration, I believe, in the work done by John Hopkins in the United States that has created its own type of service. Yes, um, John Hopkins University produced um, uh, the first dashboard uh, to track the, the epidemic and we all had our eyes on it. Uh, it's a really great tool for tracking the epidemic around the world. Um, but I think that it doesn't allow people to, to follow the epidemic in each individual country. So I wanted to focus on France and COVID Tracker um, makes it possible to track the situation uh, in each local areas and also in each uh, age group. Uh, it also allows people to, to track uh, more data, like, uh, for example, hospitalizations and uh, intensive care units, uh, beds. Uh, so, yes, the, the work of uh, GHU uh, really inspired me to build the COVID tracker. Now, Guillaume, you're a staunch defense, defender of open source data, and you say that it's a matter of democracy. Why is that? Yes, of course, I am a defender of both um, open source data and open source, um, you know, if the French public authorities um, uh, had not published uh, open data about the epidemic, um, I would never have been able to, to create a COVID tracker. So it's really important uh, to publish uh, this data in a public way, in, a, in a, an open way. Uh, it also gives confidence um, in uh, authorities because it allows us to check that the inst institutions are um, working properly. Um, it also helps uh, politicians to take decisions uh, by providing facts and uh, precise figures. Uh, so yes, I think that open data is really important for our democracy. Guillaume Rosier, thank you very much indeed for that. And we're going to move on now to Test24. Now we've got a laptop here today on the set of Test24 that proves that dual screens are still selling. It's the ZenBook Duo 14. Yeah, well, to give it its full name, Julia, it's the Asus ZenBook Duo 14 UX482. That's don't, quite a name. <laughs> don't ask me why they make these names so long, but yeah, as you said, it's got this dual screen here. So it's the idea is it will help you out if you're trying to multitask. So for example, if I want to have my mail down at the bottom here and want to get on with some work up there, I can. Um, for me, this is definitely most useful for, for people who use the Adobe suite. So if, for example, if they're editing video on here, they can have the bar down there to look across the timeline. Um, I wouldn't personally use it for my usage because the, the 
the keyboard is just a little bit fiddly and mm -hmm. the the screen is a little bit fiddly as well um but it's right and powerful. the keyboard is smaller as well yeah because so it has of the to screen all cramp be cramped into that little mm -hmm. space there but it's still powerful to enough to run the adobe suite um, but it is at 1800 euros that's a much bigger markup than it's being released in the us for which is unfortunate for people interested here in france now, Asus is not the only company investing in uh, these type of laptop that are trying to fit more than one screen. Yeah, Lenovo's at it again as well with their new generation of ThinkBook Plus. And it has this e-ink reader on the, on the top of the uh, laptop, if you like. So you can use that as an e-reader or a tablet. And whether or not you actually use it, the touch bar is ubiquitous on the MacBook Pro as well. Thank you very much, Peter. That's a wrap. And if you want to watch the show again, you can do so on our website, France24.com. See you soon.